Good morning to you from wherever you're watching us. This is the University of Nairobi channel and we are currently at the University of Nairobi Towers fourth floor. Uh, where we, uh, today, we expect to hear from the World Bank Director, Dr. Luis Lopez Calva, who will be delivering a public lecture on Poverty and Shared Prosperity 2022 Correction Course. Uh, our country in itself, Kenya, has been experiencing quite a hard economic time, and uh, the Sub-Saharan region is estimated to house the largest number of people living in extreme poverty, 60% of the people living in extreme poverty, the total of which is 700 million people, actually live in the sub-Saharan region. It is for that reason that we expect to hear what the World Bank Director, Dr. Luis Lopez Calva, has in store for us, how they will help us, they will help cushion us from these hard economic times and how that shared prosperity will be experienced, not just in Kenya, but in the sub-Saharan region as well. Ladies and gentlemen, you might be wondering what the poverty line actually you know, means. In the national poverty line, in essentially, is a typical monitoring threshold below which the basic needs of an individual cannot be met. This changes from country to country depending on the economic and uh, social circumstances. And it is for that reason that uh, national governments all across the globe are working towards ensuring that they reduce the number of people living in extreme poverty. As of the year 2022, over 700 million people actually live in extreme poverty. That number has, over the last four years, been on the rise. In the year 2019, 8.3% of the global population lived in extreme poverty. But with the COVID-19, that percentage increased from 8.4% to 9.3%, which meant that over 70 more million people got into the extreme poverty bracket. Ladies and gentlemen, there are various ways through which nations can uh, help, you know, get the number of people living in extreme poverty, you know, out of it. Among the various ways through which we can help uh, eradicate poverty is uh, through education. According to UNESCO, if only stud uh, children in low-income countries received not just uh, the basic writing and reading skills, then over 171 million people will get out of the bracket of extreme poverty. More to that, if adults got to attain at least a secondary education, then the number of people living in abject poverty would be reduced by half, which only goes to show just how not just necessary but imperative education really is towards eradicating poverty. And talking about education, we are talking about not just the quality of the education but also the establishment of appropriate infrastructure that will help uh, people get the necessary education, the technological advancement that also help people get, come up with innovations, you know, and carry out far-reaching researches that help the world become a better place. So with, if only national governments, not just in the sub-Saharan region, but, the global, uh, in the, but in the globe as well, worked towards ensuring that we all have good education, then poverty would be greatly reduced. Another point that could actually reduce uh, poverty, this is according to the 2022 uh, Poverty and uh, Shared Prosperity Report, Another reason that could uh, help, to, could push us forward towards achieving, to reducing poverty is fostering peace. When a country is peaceful, then the budget uh, that was set aside for resolving conflict, then that money gets to be earmarked for other development activities. And that is actually very much exemplified by the situation we got to witness in Cambodia, from 47.3 to a mere 13.5 in the year. 2014, which only goes to show just how important a peaceful nation is when it comes to attaining and uh, reducing the number of people living in extreme poverty. We will be sharing with you more ways through which we can reduce our poverty rates, not just in Kenya but across the globe, 
But before we do that, we would like to speak to one of the participants here who is also an economic student uh, are here at the University of Nairobi so that we can hear what they anticipate from this public lecture. And yet, uh, as you can probably see, the World Bank director, Dr. Luis Lopez Calva, is actually making his way in towards the lecture room where he will deliver this much expected and much anticipated speech. Together with his entourage, they are just about to go in and in a few minutes the event will actually be beginning. Students and staff alike are still making their way into the lecture hall. And once everyone is settled, the lecture will begin. The University of Nairobi channel will be bringing this event to you live. You can make, sh make an effort to follow us on our socials. That is UNC TV Kenya on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We are also streaming uh, the event live on our University of Nairobi channel. This whole event, the whole lecture, and the whole uh, discussion Q&A session will also be aired live uh, in, uh, here at uh, the fourth floor of the University of Nairobi Towers. So just before we begin, I'll call on my first uh, participant. Uh, please, if you could just make your way here. Karibu sana, would you kindly start by introducing yourself? Yeah, my name is Peter Nguka. I am a fourth-year student of economics here at the University of Nairobi, and I'm also the chairperson of the student association of this faculty. Uh, I think World Bank has been a very big, a very key development uh, partner for Kenya and Africa at large. So I would really expect to hear, of course, the loans that they have been giving the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, their effects on our development, and just to get how that promotes equality. And of course, there seems to be a lot of inequality in this country and even other countries in Africa. So I would expect to hear how the global director is uh, able to ad address all that. Having this particular lecture here at the University of Nairobi goes a long way to just show how committed the World Bank is, not just to empowering the you know, youth, but also students at large who are yet to transition from academia to you know, the industry. As a student, have you benefited from any programs or initiatives that the World Bank has conducted here at the university? Uh, in my fourth year alone, we have had, now this is the third forum for World Bank. Because uh, late last year, we had a public lecture by the Africa chief economist for World Bank, that is uh, Prof. Uh, Andrew Dabalin. And following that, we had an information session for the World Bank young professionals that was done led by a young man by the name Agufana Obed, who was a chief HR here in Kenya. And that has really benefited the student because now they know more about World Bank. They know the application process, the opportunities they are in, and how to apply. Are there some of uh, the students, maybe even yourself, who have benefited maybe from uh, internship opportunities well offered by the uh, World Bank, or are you in the process of applying for these kind of opportunities? Uh, currently, the opportunities that were available were not available here in Kenya, but in the main office in Washington, D.C. But then we have seen master's students or those who have graduated apply for those opportunities, and we are very, very hopeful that they will clinch, uh, will, they'll get the opportunities. So what, what I'm getting from you is that uh, be, now considering that the whole uh, topic today is about uh, you know, shared prosperity, as a youth and as a student here at the University of Nairobi, you can indeed confirm that to uh, some point you are indeed experiencing this shared prosperity. Yeah, for example, as a country, we always have a budgetary deficit of around 800 billion yearly, because then our budget is around 3.63 trillion, but our revenue is about 2.8 trillion. So we have around 800 uh, billion, which is a deficit. Then we have to get this money from somewhere. And I think World Bank has come in as one of the biggest and the greatest development uh, partners trying to give us these loans. Just recently, they gave us a loan of around $750 million to help us just recover from COVID-19 uh, uh, the scenario. And uh, that has been very, very helpful there because we now have to recover, then we now have to bring some measures, we have to reduce taxes, and that money comes in to cushion uh, the economy. So I say World Bank has really tried to help us as a country. Is there more to be done? And if so, what more can be done? There's a lot to be done because when we get that money, 
in most of the times we have the money comes with a lot of uh, conditions. One of the conditions is to privatize some companies, some government parastatals that are making losses. And we have seen that even with the restructuring of the universities. And I think this university has been a casualty for that because then recently we saw that uh, there's a lot of restructuring in the university. Recently we also saw that the Ministry of Education wanted to increase the fees and to reduce the university funding. And that is part of the conditions that, are, that the loans comes with. So I think one of the things that World Bank should be working on is to give us loans that do not have a lot of conditions. Just the same, same way that it does to the other countries like China or those big countries. I am sure the World Bank director will hear this and hopefully will work on it. We are more than grateful for your time. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you have heard, uh, one of the students here, uh, Mr. Peter, who is uh, not only an economic student here, believes that one of the ways through which this poverty reduction can be achieved is uh, through the reduction of uh, interest that the World Bank affords countries like Kenya. Because uh, it tends, to, uh, at times, as he stated clearly, the rates tend to be different for countries like Kenya and other more developed countries. So if only the part of interest could be more addre could be addressed, then chances are the more individuals would uh, rise economically and can, the number of people living in extreme poverty in the Kenya, in the country, would be reduced. That was our first participant. I would now like to welcome another participant uh, to share her views and uh, learn what, to, what she expects from the World Bank Director's speech today. Karibu sana. I just want to give the welcoming remarks. Please but I'll start by introducing yourself. Uh, my name is Gitaranga Esther. I'm the Secretary General of Women's Students Welfare Association at here at the University of Nairobi. Okay. Uh, the, we are about to begin, uh, so kindly allow, allow us to we'll continue with the interview in a short while. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we will continue with the interview in a few minutes, but for now, we take you back into the lecture hall where the event is about to begin. I know that... Uh, uh, a number of you are quite busy, but we are very grateful for you getting the time to come. So, uh, to our chief guest, who is uh, the Global Director for World Bank Poverty and Equity, Dr. Luis Felipe, uh, to our Vice Chancellor, uh, who is uh, today being represented by the Dean, Faculty of Arts and uh, Social Sciences, uh, Professor Jack, is presenting the VC uh, to the World Bank delegation and uh, our colleagues from Kenyatta University, our colleagues from uh, Technical University, our colleagues from Kipra, our colleagues from ARC, colleagues from FSD, our colleagues from Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, and uh, the civil society organizations uh, who are here the Institute for Social uh, Accountability, Oxfam, as well as Haki Jami, and uh, to the faculty members who are present here, including our dean of the faculty. We also have the two associate dean. We have uh, Professor uh, Karuti Kanyinga here, uh, associate dean in charge of uh, uh, postgraduate studies and research uh, is here. And uh, we also had uh, uh, also another associate dean, uh, students as well as the members of staff uh, from our Department of Economics. I can see that uh, we are greatly represented here, the Department of Economics. Uh, I can see we are almost a full house here as members of the staff, and thank you very much for coming. And for the students, uh, I know we have uh, student leaders who are here, the entire uh, student community of uh, the postgraduate students as well as the, the master students. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, let me take this opportunity to warmly welcome you to this public lecture. The uh, University of Nairobi community as well as uh, the Department of Economics and Development Studies uh, uh, is very much delighted to host the global director for World Bank Poverty and Equity, Global Practice, Dr. Luis Felipe, 
who is actually going to present uh, the main findings of the 2022 Poverty and Shared Prosperity Report, Correcting the Cause. This is actually in line with uh, the work that is being done by the Kenyan Node of African Center of Excellence for Inequality Research, that is ASEA, which mainly focuses on, uh, on uh, research on poverty as well as uh, inequality. We know that this lecture is expected to broaden the understanding of the global challenges of poverty and inequality and highlight the World Bank latest poverty and shared uh, prosperity report. This particular lecture is also very important because, uh, you know, with the students being here and other university community, they'll be able to have networks on, issue, on different issues to do with poverty and equity, and also uh, actually understand some of the challenges and opportunities that are avail available in, the, uh, in this uh, uh, particular area. So by bringing together the latest evidence, because actually this is the latest evidence, sometimes we, also, we always say that this is from the kitchen. You have heard about something from the kitchen. It is very hot, is that not so? <laughs> this is very, very hot because <laughs> it is just coming from the kitchen now. So by bringing together the latest evidence, uh, this corporate flagship report provides a foundation for informed advocacy around ending extreme poverty and improving the lives of the poorest in every country in the world. Furthermore, the lecture gives opportunity to connect scholars, students, development practitioners, policy makers in an informal uh, setting for further networking that will promote continued intellectual and pro uh, policy engagement on Kenya's poverty and equity. We hope you are going to enjoy the, uh, the lecture now, I want to take you through the program, which uh, I'm sure a number of you were also able to receive uh, this uh, program. Now, uh, uh, the program started at around uh, uh, 10.30, okay, the registration, and then now um, the national anthem. Uh, I don't know whether we, we will be able to have the national anthem then we'll be able to have uh, the remarks by the dean, and the dean is actually being represented by Professor Karuti Kanyinga, who will, be, will actually be representing the dean. And then um, we'll also have the remarks from the vice chancellor, going to be represented by uh, the dean, uh, Professor Jack. And uh, we'll have the discussant of the paper, our mentor, Professor Jamano Mwabu will be discussing the paper after the presentation. Then we'll be having the question and answer session, and then we'll have the vote of uh, the vote of thanks. So basically, that is uh, the program that we have uh, before us. And as the presentation is uh, going on, you will actually prepare questions so that they'll be able to fit into uh, the question and answer. Uh, session. So um, at this particular time, um, I'm going to invite uh, uh, Professor Karuti Kanyinga just to come and give the remarks as you invite the dean who will be coming uh, uh, to represent the VC. Thank you very much. The, thank you very much, Chairman, Department of Economics and Development Studies. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much again, and let me take this opportunity to welcome everyone to the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and also to the school, um, uh, to the Department of Economics and Development Studies. Um, before I invite the Dean um, to speak on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, um, let me just point out that the topic of discussion today it's a topic of great interest to students of economics and development studies. But unfortunately, it's also the most important uh, subject in the Bible and in religious studies that I don't think people look at the Bible from a political economy point of view, right? Um, and uh, simply because if you look at the Bible, actually the Bible says the poor will always be with us. 
I, I think there is a phrase of the sort um, where Jesus said, the poor will always be with us. If I'm not wrong, the Bible says something close to that. And that in itself tells you that we are dealing with a historically difficult challenge. A, a challenge of not only equity, but also a challenge of justice, if one can say that. Because if we have not been able to address issues of poverty from that particular period, and all of us have been even forgetting that the Bible lays a foundation for us to discuss such a phenomena issue, then there is something absolutely wrong with what we do. The poor will always be with us. But there are certain policies, deliberate and undeliberate, that different governments pursue and they do not address issues of poverty. In Kenya here, I think it's important for us to bear in mind that they are the historically disadvantaged counties, historically disadvantaged communities, historically disadvantaged children, where children are born today, but they are not likely to have the 50th birthday. A child born in Moyale and a child born in Bomed are very different in terms of access opportunities. A child born in Madeira is likely not to have the 50th birthday compared to a child born in Bomed or Kirinyaga or Meru. A child born in Wajir, Samburu, Trukana, Garissa, and all other disadvantaged counties, including Kwale, Kilifi, Tana River, and Lamu, attends school for just only an average of about 30% of the schools. We have got historically disadvantaged communities, and we really pay attention to them. And any attempt to pay attention to them results in people saying that you are creating opportunities for some, for some uh, to advantage them at the disadvantage of other groups. I'm opening this simply because we do not look at the discussion that is going to come with our, uh, with our uh, keynote speaker here and look at it as if it is an abstract discussion. It is not. If you look at even inequalities in terms of access, the report that has already been given out, if you look at inequalities in terms of access to healthcare, access to medical services, again, it leaves a lot to be desired that there are some communities with very poor and limited access to health care facilities. Again, one can go on and on and say, it's time to start thinking about how do we address these global inequalities? How do we address uh, this phenomenon of poverty so that individuals grow together knowing that they have a, a common cause? Um, but the disadvantages go to rock people everywhere. I'm told that even when the poor die, they are buried differently from the rich. Uh, let me invite, uh, <laughs> of course, the casket of the rich is very different from the poor person. And they are going to the same place, right? Let me take this opportunity to invite the Dean Faculty of Arts and Social, Service, uh, Social Sciences, uh, Professor Jack Odiambo. Uh, please welcome Professor Jack Odiambo. Thank you very much, Professor Kanyinga, the associate dean in charge of research and postgraduate. I had remarks as dean, but now since I have been asked to represent the vice chancellor, I will go ahead directly to his comments. The World Bank Global Director for Poverty and Equality and Equity Global Practice, Dr. Luis Felipe Lopez Calva, World Bank Regional Director for Global Practice, um, Associate Dean, Faculty of Arts, Chair, Department of Economics, discussant of today, Professor Mwabu, uh, faculty members, uh, students, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to the University of Nairobi for this important lecture and engagement with the Global Director for Poverty and Equity Global Practice, Dr. Luis Felipe Lopez Carla. The public lecture has been organized by the Department of Economics in collaboration with the World Bank team in Nairobi with the aim of highlighting the main findings of the PS 
PR 2020, 2022, sorry, and subsequently stimulating an intellectual and policy debate around the implications of the findings on, the, on Kenya's agenda to reduce poverty and promote equity. I am pleased that the World Bank has chosen the University of Nairobi for this public lecture that is likely to stimulate exciting debates on the hot topic of poverty and equity. These two concepts feature prominently and frequently in our national discourses. The global community had made tremendous progress on poverty reduction prior to the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. The economic shocks from the devastating effects of COVID-19 and climate change continue to reverse important milestones achieved by the international community in poverty reduction. The PSPR 2022 report acknowledges that in the 30-year pursuit of successful poverty reduction, global poverty had declined from more than one in three persons, that is 38% of the global population in 1990, to less than 10 persons, which is 8.4% by 2019. The historic setback in fighting against poverty has also been accompanied by increased inequality. As an academic and research institution, the launch of this report, therefore, provides us with the opportunity to contribute to intellectual scholarship and dialogue by providing a free public forum for public interaction on poverty and equity issues. To help in the correct interpretation and dissemination of the report to all stakeholders, and we are ready to work with the World Bank in the dissemination of this report, to interrogate the findings and translate them into policies that will assist develop countries, sorry, assist developing countries and least developed countries in choosing viable policy alternatives that will raise government revenues and public spending without making the poor worse off, increase agricultural productivity, create more employment opportunities, distribute national resources equitably through taxation, transfers, and subsidies. Policy choices will always differ across national and regional contexts, and it is impressive, imperative sorry, for the scholars and think tanks institutions to formulate policy alternatives that are unique to our local context. With those opening remarks, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my humble duty and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Luis Felipe Lopez Calva is the Global Director for the World Bank's group, Poverty and Equity Global Practice, GP, in the Equitable Growth Finance and Institutions Vice Presidency. Dr. Lopez Calva has over 25 years of professional experience working with international institutions and advising national governments. He rejoined the World Bank in 2022 from the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, where he served as UN Assistant Secretary General and Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean. In his previous tenure at the World Bank, he held various positions, including Practice Manager of Poverty and Equity, GP for Europe, and Central Asia, Co-Director of the 2017 World Development Report on Governance and the Law, Lead Economist and Regional Poverty Advisor in the Poverty and Equity, GP for Europe and Central Asia, and Lead Economist in the Poverty, Equity, and Gender Unit in the Poverty Reduction and Economic Management, PREM, Directorate for Latin America and the Caribbean. He's a board member of the Global Development Network and a fellow of the Human Development and Capacities Association. His research interests focus on labor markets, poverty, inequality, institutions, and the microeconomics of development. He has published extensively on these issues in peer-reviewed academic journals, books, and policy reports. He holds a PhD and a master's in economics from Cornell University 
and a master's degree in economics from Boston University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Luis Felipe Alvarez Lopez Calva. Good morning, thank you very much to the uh, authorities, academic authorities of the university, to the faculty, to um, uh, the Department of Economics and Development Studies, um, to the African uh, Center of Excellence for Research and Inequality, and all uh, the um, members of the university that were uh, involved in uh, giving us this opportunity to present the work that I will present in a minute. It's an honor to be here. Um, and really uh, looking forward to the, to the discussion. So I'm here also accompanied by colleagues who work here in the Nairobi office. Uh, Pire Lapache, our practice manager for Eastern Africa in the poverty practice. Uh, Precious, who is our, uh, the lead of the team uh, working on poverty here in, in, in Nairobi and our, our other colleagues from, from the bank office. And I know, I know that the university works very closely with the bank in many areas and we would like to strengthen those links also um, uh, um, after this presentation and uh, looking at common interests, particularly in the areas of poverty and inequality. And I particularly appreciate that you all take the time to, to, to come here to discuss our uh, report, even though you are in a well-deserved summer break after, after the ending of the previous semester. So, Really uh, a great opportunity for me to be here, and thank you also for the generous introduction that I hope doesn't raise expectations too high, because <laughs> now I have to deliver. <laughs> so let me uh, um, present what, what we uh, prepared in the bank. We, every, every two years, we present a global monitoring report that we call the Poverty and Shared Prosperity Report. And we do it um, in collaboration with, uh, let me just make sure that I don't go over time, uh, that we do it in collaboration always with the research department uh, at the World Bank. And we try to choose, uh, of course, to do all the monitoring, but also to try to choose a policy issue of relevance and then try to also discuss that. So in, that, in this particular case, we will talk about uh, fiscal policies in response to the, to the global pandemic and the cons economic consequences of the pandemic. Just two, two uh, comments before I start. One is that um, there, is a, um, there is a colleague in the bank um, who has this uh, mug that says, a very nice story, but show me the data. Uh, to emphasize this idea that we in the bank try to um, al always uh, provide evidence uh, for uh, the advice and the conclusions that we provide and uh, we put uh, on, on the uh, public uh, conversation about policy. But I just want to tell you that I also uh, always ask the teams to reverse that and, uh, and also tell them very good data, but now tell me the story. So I really want you to, today to focus on the data, but also on the story that we're gonna here to tell you and uh, perhaps to encourage you to challenge that story and to try to uh, come up with a, with a common perspective on the issues that I will present to you. The most important message of the report is that um, uh, we had the largest increase, due to the pandemic um, and the economic consequences of the pandemic, we had the, the highest increase in poverty uh, during 2020 we debated how to say this. We wanted to say since World War II. Uh, and we are pretty convinced that that's the case, but given that we didn't measure poverty the same way for a certain period of time, we certainly can say that it's the largest increase in poverty globally since we started monitoring poverty and measuring it the way that we do it. So it was a really um, important shock uh, globally. And that reinforced a trend in which the reduction in poverty that we observed globally had been slowing down. So basically what we see with the pandemic and after is that the reduction in poverty that we saw globally for decades basically came to a halt. Uh, so that is a very important message. And as I will show in a minute, we will, we will see that inequality also increased globally. Um, 
and that the fiscal response of governments that try to compensate for that shock was uh, successful, but with a large degree of heterogeneity across countries. So in, as I will show in many countries, actually the response uh, almost compensated the shock. In other cases, it was very partially compensate, a partial compensation of the shock. So this is not a trivial message. I will, I will tell you in a minute uh, with a graph how um, also um, SDG 1, which is the uh, ending poverty by 2030, is fundamentally out of reach. If we continue, let's say, business as usual, either we so do something different or we will just not achieve uh, that goal uh, given the current trends. You can see here that there have been a, you know, um, a lower uh, a, a poverty every year uh, for, for, for decades. And that trend, however, was a little bit less uh, steep for the case of, of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but still there was this, this decline in poverty. And before COVID, by 2019, um, uh, most of the, uh, I mean, the largest share of, of the extreme poor in the world were actually in, the, in Africa, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I can tell you that um, uh, we also updated the, the purchasing power parity uh, adjustment factors for the, for the poverty lines. So the extreme poverty line that you will be um, uh, seeing here is at $215 per person per day in PPP corrected numbers, okay? You see here, the, the, these, these bars show the reduction uh, mainly, in, in most cases, reduction in poverty uh, over the years. You see a systematic negative bar, which means um, a, a reduction in poverty, except for certain cases like the oil shock in the 70s, like the crisis in 2008-19, but never the size, the magnitude of the increase in poverty is uh, by far uh, not comparable to what we observed in, uh, in the global pandemic, okay? So we had never experienced a shock like that. Now, uh, when, we, when we see the, the aftermath of, of, the, of the crisis, then you see that yes, there is uh, a recovery, uh, but still the trend is far from being the one that we observed uh, in the pre-COVID um, uh, period. Global inequality also increased. And here we have a little bit of a mixed picture because most of the change in global inequality can be explained in the particular case of this increase by um, a, a divergence in income levels across countries. So if we divide the change in inequality globally between uh, what we call, uh, uh, between country inequality, which is basically growth convergence or divergence versus within country inequality, which is the one we tend to think of when, when we are in a specific context, um, uh, two thirds of the reduction, or sorry, of the increase in inequality during the pandemic is because basically countries uh, grew apart in terms of the levels of income. Um, but globally, the, if we adopt these two effects, actually, uh, uh, not only poverty increased in most countries, but um, um, also inequality increased uh, globally. If we go to the, to the within country inequality, and this is important to, to, be, to qualify, we see heterogeneous impact. In the majority of countries, inequality fell. And we always qualify because people can say, okay, well, that's a good thing. But what happened actually is that the whole income distribution suffered a contraction. So in a way, it's a reduction in inequality that you don't want to observe because it's a reduction in inequality accompanied by a contraction in economic growth and an increase in poverty. So that, uh, so that is why this within country inequality has to be uh, analyzed um, with, uh, with this nuance. Um, if you see the same trajectory that we observe globally, it's very uh, similar in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, basically a derail, derailing of the trend that we had observed 
in terms of, of uh, poverty reduction. And uh, so there has, as, as I will explain, and I will go at the end to some ideas on this, we need to do things different if we want to revert that trend. And given that, uh, basically what we want to emphasize in this graph is that eventually, very soon, uh, basically speaking about global poverty reduction will be mainly uh, speaking about sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so most of the global poverty at the level of 215 will be concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa, and then we have to focus on this uh, region in order to really be successful in that, in that objective. Um, so if we actually try to project uh, further, we see that, uh, what, what I told you before, the, the goal of reaching 3% global poverty by 2030 was already uh, a questioned before because of the trend, but now with this impact of the crisis, we are even farther away from achieving that goal. So at this moment, um, and we really wanted to make this message uh, very strongly, uh, to, to send this message very strongly, that we, the, the goal of ending poverty, which is SDG 1, is out of reach for the world if we continue uh, business as usual and we do not do something different. There are other aspects that we also show in the report that really matter, which are non-monetary um, dimensions of poverty and that are important also because of the long-term effect that can have on future uh, trends in terms of poverty, productivity, and so on. So you can see the one that has been discussed, of course, uh, you know, uh, very broadly in the world is the impact on education. Uh, but there were also impacts, uh, other impacts that, uh, um, that relate to access to services and so on. So basically, uh, impacts that are more related to access to services or human capital in terms of education may have a very important long-term effect in the productivity of households and, and thus the, poverty, the productivity of the economy as a whole. And very important that we look at other poverty lines because we focus on the, on the extreme poverty line, which is this 215. Um, so we look at, for example, the, the sort of the highest poverty line that we use in the bank, which is the one for upper middle income countries, which is not as high, but it's at $6.85 per person per day in PPPD terms. We, uh, we show that 47% of the world is below that line. So that means that if we took that as a poverty line globally, almost half of the population of the world could be poor. So that is to show that economic growth continues to be a very important objective uh, for, the, for, for countries and for the world uh, uh, as a whole. Well, we mentioned also some data challenges, and we, as you know, we work very closely with governments uh, in, the, uh, in the World Bank and with other international organizations to strengthen the statistical capacity of countries, but still we see uh, important data gaps that we, we want to, uh, uh, to, uh, to address in order to be able to continue this monitoring uh, in the best way that is useful for policy. So this is the first part of the report. We show basically the trends. These are the main conclusions. Then we move to uh, what, how can we assess the response of governments uh, to deal with this crisis? So let me briefly, given that we are in an academic context, tell you. So what, the best potentially, uh, in, rather, in, in, in my view on many peoples, uh, one good explanation of what happened with the COVID crisis is what they called, um, the literature called the supply side Keynesian shock. So basically a very abrupt disruption of, of supply chains whose multiplier effect on the demand side cre it started creating this spiral down. So basically what you have is a spiral down in terms of a reinforcement of supply and demand shocks, right? So in that case, the best textbook of a response by governments could be what we can call uh, the government becoming the, the buyer of last resort. 
I mean, the government should step in and say, well, we, I will pay for the tickets for the airlines even though there are no flights, so you can continue paying the salaries. I will pay for the hotel rooms even though there are no tourists, so you can continue paying the salaries and keeping the business. Because the, the idea was to protect both the productive fabric, but also the demand side, the income of people, so they could actually stay at home and they could continue protecting their, their le le level of, of, of well-being. So this is the textbook response. But then the government has limited instruments to do that and limited fiscal capacity to do that. So basically what governments did is an imperfect response to that by expanding, uh, fundamentally injecting liquidity on the supply side and uh, transferring cash on the demand side to try to maintain the economy going, right? So what we analyze in this report is mainly the fiscal response on the demand side, basically injecting cash to households to try to maintain uh, the aggregate demand at the level, at the, at the reasonable level to protect the well-being of people. Here you see the two dots in this graph show the pre and post intervention um, levels of, of, of poverty. And what you can see, because of the size of the, you know, the magnitude of the, of the line between the two points, is the large heterogeneity in terms of how successful, successful governments were in responding to the crisis. So you can see countries where actually uh, the, the, the difference, you know, pre-shock and post-shock was more, almost compensated by the fiscal uh, response. In other cases, it was uh, very ineffective, right? And um, this is, of course, explained, as, as we show in the report, by different levels of capacity of governments to respond. So think of, of for example, we can say we emulate the, respond, the, the response of, um, before I go to specific examples, we, em we imitate the response of, of, of uh, uh, developed countries who have ca fiscal capacity and institutional capacity to play this role of buyer of large resort, right? So in that sense, they inject liquidity on the supply side and they inject income on the demand side. And they have the instruments to do it. So in those cases, in, in relatively richer countries, the compensation was almost complete. So they managed to contain the effect of the, of the of the crisis, right? But as you move to different levels of fiscal and institutional capacity of countries, you can see that this response is more, much more ineffective. Suppose you inject liquidity through the monetary policy and through the banking sector in a country that has very limited financial intermediation. Then the impact is not gonna be as large. Or you try to inject uh, you know, transfers or, or do uh, you know, um, implement fiscal subsidies in a country that has large levels of informality. Or you want to distribute cash in a country that has limited registry, uh, institutional registry to know where the money should go and to whom the money should go, right? So all this is shown in the heterogeneity in the response, uh, sorry, in, in the result of that response. So basically, there is a very high correlation, and this is the main message here, very high correlation between capacity of, of the countries in terms of the institutions and fiscally, and the effect in terms of the compensation. So lower uh, middle income countries and low income countries had, were more, much less, less successful, okay? But we have some interesting examples, like South Africa, that actually responded very generously and managed to uh, by, by almost uh, compensate fully the effect. We have the case of, of Togo, this is a low-income country uh, that was uh, uh, not well positioned, and then it had, of course, uh, in a way, the other, the other side of the story, but they made a big effort. All of these countries made a big effort to respond. We have the case of Brazil that, uh, that left the, the COVID crisis with lower levels of poverty that, you know, that, than the levels at which you know, they entered the crisis because the response was really, really important. But what happens also in a country that is growing in the last 10 years, 2% per year or 3% per year, you inject 10% of GDP in one, 
in one year, of course, what you had the, the following years is very high inflation and uh, uh, distortions that, I mean, it's not, it's not cost-free to have this type of very, very uh, aggressive response. Okay. The other issue we point out in the report is that the way you collect resources to redistribute really matters. And in countries in which most of the tax collection is through value-added taxes, which means basically consumption taxes, we saw that there are countries in which, yes, the government manages to collect and redistribute and reduce inequality, but the poorest end up worse off. Why? Because a larger share of their, of their income goes to consumption. Uh, so that, you know, the, the fact that the tax collection is through consumption taxes ends up hurting some of these poorest uh, groups in the population. So what we basically bring to the attention of policymakers is be careful in terms of how the poorest are going to end up after the whole process of redistribution, particularly taking into account the way in which co taxes are collected through, through consumption cases, uh, uh, taxes, sorry. Um, so, in many cases, as, as we show in this graph, the impact of the overall, you know, tax collection redistribution ended up with largest, uh, uh, large, uh, uh, um, sorry, not large, with an increase in poverty, uh, even though they managed to reduce inequality. So, it seems like a paradox, but it's an important result that we show. So you redistribute, reduce inequality, but some of the poor people are, wor are left worse off. So that is, um, um, in, in these cases, the, the orange uh, small bar that you see in these bars is the increase in poverty after the whole process of uh, redistribution. So it's an important thing to bring to the attention. Finally, the report looks at those, um, I have five minutes left, so, I, I can explain this carefully, more carefully. This is an important, this is a literature that brings, you know, the optimal taxation literature and the cost-benefit analysis literature into something that is called the marginal, the marginal uh, uh, impact of, of public uh, revenue. Uh, um, so basically, what you do is you analyze what is the largest bang for the buck or the largest impact in the overall economy that you have by choosing, into dif uh, by choosing different budget items, okay? And, and, and basically what you see is that, perhaps I would say two groups of, of impacts. One uh, um, type of expenditure that has very large impact uh, socially is early interventions in human capital investments. For example, early childhood, early childhood development investments education at the, at the elementary level. Uh, this type of early interventions um, have, a, you know, important social impact o over time. And the others have to do with productivity enhancing investments, for example, related to infrastructure. If you invest in those things that become essential inputs to increase the productivity of the overall economy, then that has a very large social impact. So basically, um, uh, um, what, what we um, try to suggest at the end of the report is that the, reorient, the reorientation of spending, uh, and this is, it's very important to say because this can be misinterpreted, we are not saying that cash transfers should not be an instrument. Actually, as we showed in all the first part uh, of, the, of the, um, the first part of the second part of the report, uh, actually, cash transfers were very important to protect people. But the idea is that at the margin, as you move with a more, as you have a more forward-looking perspective, at the margin, you should invest, invest more in those uh, that have the largest social impact long-term. Education, particularly early, early, at early uh, ages, and infrastructure that is productivity-enhancing. That could inclu include, for example, Things like uh, health, education, uh, digital um, connectivity, and so on. Um, 
so you know, I, w I will um, uh, leave it there, and just to say that uh, because I have, I want to give you a final message. Uh, so what we say that that's why the, 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 that we chose that title for the report is again, business as usual is not going to work for poverty eradication. We need we need to think and fine tune the policies if we really want to achieve that goal. And th those policies have to look at the productive side of, of the economy. We, as I said before, because growth really matters, but it has to be done in a way that it's embedded in the growth strategy. You have a poverty reduction and inequality uh, reduction in the policy. How, do, how can you do that? Well, in the poverty and, 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 and global practice, as you know, uh, poverty and equity global practice in the bank we try to provide numbers, information, as I said before, data on poverty headcounts, on share prosperity indicators that are, as you know, in the bank, we talk about the growth of income for the bottom 40 of the income distribution. Those at the bottom, how much they are increasing or not their incomes. We look at median incomes to see, to see how the median person in society is, is, is doing. We look at Gini in, this, in the index to look at inequality and other indicators of inequality. All that, really what tries to, is trying to do is to, to, to give us numbers that reflect what is the pattern of growth in the overall economy. So we care about growth incidence. In a way, we are the microeconomists of growth incidence how different groups of the population are contributing to growth and are being treated by the fiscal redistribution. And, the, and this gives us the, the full picture. Look at, for example, the graph of, of um, um, I actually had a graph for, for uh, Kenya, but I don't know, if, let me see, yeah. So we have a, a success story in a way in Kenya for the last, uh, so, uh, until the pre-COVID uh, uh, situation. And, and the story is actually one of, of progressive growth incidence, meaning that the income of those at the bottom were growing at a faster rate compared to those at the top. Okay? And that shows in part why we had poverty reduction and so on. And the question is, you see, my time is, is up. Um, so, and this is why um, um, we have to understand this is not... Uh, um, an accident, right? You have to understand what, is, what are the engines of growth, what is the type of growth that is generating this pattern, and eventually if this pattern is, if this line is flattening out, the idea is what is happening that this pattern is changing. And for that we need to understand the capacity of the poor to contribute to economic growth. And with this I will close. So the poor are not only providers of labor, the poor, the poor have human capital, which includes education and health, but they also have physical capital. It could be land or other type. They potentially can have financial capital if they are connected to, to, the, to the markets. They have social capital, all the community-based uh, management of resources, all the community-based reciprocity networks, and so on. And we have natural capital, which is very important for environmental sustainability. So the idea is to look at all these types of capital and try to understand this pattern and uh, as I have been discussing in my visit also in other countries here in the region, the idea is not only to think about how we reduce poverty. The idea is how we think an inclusive growth strategy that by construction is going to result in a reduction of poverty in a productive way. So I leave it here and I open uh, for uh, the discussion and I'm looking forward to the comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, our uh, chief guest, for a well-delivered lecture. I think uh, 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 Dr. Felipe needs another round of applause. That was not enough. <laughs> uh, th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm actually going to invite Professor Damiano to moderate the next uh, uh, session. Uh, thank you very much.
thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Luis Felipe, for that very good presentation. Uh, just to mention one or two things. Um, you see what he has summarized is covering many countries. Uh, uh, trying to do the same for one country takes as much more time. So there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of work that uh, has gone into that uh, presentation. Uh, we have been trying to do that for Kenya and, um, and the neighboring countries and it takes all our time. Sometimes we say we don't have time to do some of these things. So that presentation is very rich, uh, covering uh, several countries and giving directions. Of course, the directions may not be specific to a particular country and uh, therefore it will require that uh, countries now can look at that and see what they can do. So anyway, um, let us move to the next uh, 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 session, which, is, um, which will involve a discussion. And we have um, uh, a lead discussant, that is uh, Professor Jamano Mwapu. As you know, Professor Jamano Mwapu is in the Department of Economics. Uh, and development studies, <coughs> and Professor has Professor Mwapo has done a lot of work, generally in the area of poverty, health, education, uh, and is a member of the ASEA, the African Center of Excellence for Inequality Research, which is a note in the Department of Economics and. Um, uh, development studies. So I will wel welcome Professor Mwapu to come and uh, give his uh, brief discussion. Uh, and thereafter, we will open uh, the session for questions and answers. So the way I, uh, after Professor Mwapu has uh, done his discussion, uh, we may, we may, we will welcome Professor Felipe to, re, to respond if you will have raised uh, several questions. And thereafter, then we'll go to question and answers where maybe we'll give, we'll open up uh, the session for questions. Maybe four questions, four, question, four questions from, or four people asking questions. So the way I will go about it is, you ask a straightforward question. Don't go around it. Yeah, so ask a straightforward question uh, so that we take a little time. So, and uh, don't ask all the questions. You can ask one or two, then another person one or two. <laughs> so if we exhaust, then we'll come back to you if you still more. Yeah, I have more. So thank you so much. So let me welcome Professor Mwap. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Manda. And uh, I'm also grateful that uh, many of our students are attending this session. So for Dr. Luis Felipe, actually, I want to say you are, your presentation is, uh, is original in a way that uh, many in the audience may not recognize because they have not been following uh, this debate for as long as I've been following it since uh, the 19, uh, maybe actually from the 1980s. Okay. So the World Bank, I want to say, has been producing these uh, poverty reports for a long time. And um, what is different about this report 
is it shows the magnitude of the poverty that the world has. And actually, in, um, uh, in a departure from the, uh, from the practice, Dr. Lewis also shows what can be done about this problem. Okay? So that is actually a unique thing. What can be done before the World Bank used to come to poor countries and say you are very poor. They think, what are we? They don't, they don't actually uh, uh, even try to guess what you could do okay, to, do, to tackle this problem. Um, Dr. Lewis also has been explicit that the aim of the World Bank with, with the other partners is actually not just to reduce poverty, to actually end it, to actually have a situation where there is no poverty. Now, some people, of course, might say, okay, that looks like uh, it's not feasible. Um, but um, those, are, those of us familiar with how we measure poverty, we can actually, as he shown very well, actually, very well, uh, we can end poverty today by choosing a particular poverty line. When he chose a poverty line, <laughs> Yeah, just miraculously, yes. When he chose a poverty line of $2.15, poverty was 8.3%. And actually, it may even become 3% at the, at the desired horizon, which is 2030. Which is 2030. Uh, but if you choose a poverty line of about... Uh, Six point something dollars, actually 50%, nearly 50% of the population becomes impoverished, is poor. Okay, so, and this is, this is an, an issue which he, he mentions in the passing, since he realizes it's a big issue, which is that the poverty that we report in our papers based on poverty lines, is actually uh, much smaller than the real poverty in the world. Actually, measuring poverty properly is yet a very difficult issue uh, for two reasons. One, the poverty line uh, that is needed is not very easy to construct. Number two, okay, we are measuring poverty of who? Of individuals. But we have data on what? on households. So, so actually, okay, these numbers are approximations to the, to the true poverty uh, magnitude, but still is better than not having any. Okay, so um, um, there are many good things about this poverty report. I've, I've mentioned one on um, uh, what can be done, and I will come I will say a little bit about that. Um, but of course, I can't come here and just to praise the report. Okay? Okay. And, uh, and not also, but also not to, crit to criticize it for its own sake. All right. So now, what, what poverty metrics have been chosen in this report? Actually, two. Okay. The hand count, the number of poor people over time, and also the hand count ratio. Okay, and the proportion of the population that is poor. But we know there's another measure which we have been the report is silent about. And this is uh, the FGT, when alpha, as he knows, uh, Dr. Filippo knows very well, when alpha is equal to two. That means the poverty gap. So actually, it's possible for poor pe the numbers of poor people to rise, and also for, uh, for the hand count ratio also to rise, as the poverty gap actually and, uh, falls. All right, so what, the, in, uh, so what this means is, uh, um, 
A person is poor when they are below a poverty line. If you are one, if one, if you are one shilling below the poverty line, you are poor. If you are 10 shillings below, you are poor. Okay? Say uh, zero. If you have actually no income, okay? You are also, you're also poor. So actually, it's possible for your income to increase even by 50%, okay? And it still remain poor, okay? So that nuance is captured by the poverty gap, okay? Which, uh, which actually is really important in, in, in many, many, paper, many police papers, except some academic papers on poverty. So perhaps um, maybe in the future, uh, the bank can consider uh, reporting also the poverty gaps. But the issue is actually how to interpret the poverty gap. I will not go into that issue, but I think that's, uh, that is why poverty gaps are, are really important. Um, but if they are important, as people get used to, uh, to reading them, they will actually learn how to interpret them. Okay. Now, the second point I want to mention has to do with the second part of the presentation, which is how policymakers responded to the, the pandemic, in particular the crisis. Not just the crisis, but actually to the, to the large uh, poverty that populations are experiencing. Now, the concrete response is uh, fiscal measures or fiscal measures for one kind or another. Basically, uh, taxing people for, man for government to, to get the money to finance things that reduce uh, poverty. And what the report shows is uh, actually social spending, spending uh, by the government, financed by taxation, tends to, actually not tends, actually we know from many countries, that spending reduces inequality which is a concern in this report, was, which was not a concern in many previous reports. It reduces inequality, but it increases poverty. Okay. So inequality is going down because of social, this response, but uh, poverty is actually going up. Actually, I was waiting to see a recommendation on that point with regard to, with regard to taxation. Because now, for example, the, the Kenya government now is trying to collect as much money, actually to increase tax, tax revenues, which, which it must do in order to finance uh, uh, development projects. But the issue then is how is it to be done? If it's through that, then definitely what we know, there will be a reduction in equality, but mm -hmm. an increase in poverty. If, it's, if much of it is raised through that. If not, then um, maybe we may have a, a different story. Um, so this, this finding uh, g gives us time or opportunity to think of the practice, how to actually raise, raise the money we need to invest in things that uh, um, reduce, uh, 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 reduce poverty and inequality. And the, uh, Dr. Lewis, and a very nice diagram here uh, on, um, it's called the assets approach, actually to ending poverty. There's a lot in that diagram, and I just in the conclusion, I want to uh, discuss one strategy based on that, that diagram. In his presentation, this development strategy based on that diagram is titled, um, grow the nursing prop, uh, strategy, which accompanied by uh, tax, uh, 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 fiscal measures that are progressive, which actually don't uh, uh, widen the income, don't uh, widen the income distribution. Actually, so the new term for the, for the same thing is uh, uh, prong growth, Poverty reduction strategy. This is actually from your university, Cornell, by Eric Thorbeck, actually, 
the last year, in his uh, paper, Wound in Development, okay, he came up with this idea that uh, the best way to end, the best route, the most promising route to ending poverty is to pursue pro-growth poverty reduction strategy. And this is a strategy that initially ta tackles poverty and inequality at the same time. So if you take this measure, poverty goes down at the same time and also inequality goes down. And this is a measure of massive transfers at targeted, substantial transfers to the poor. If you, if you, give, the, if you give the poor uh, uh, some income, obviously the income rises, so actually you end, there you are, you are tackling inequality, but you're also ending poverty at the same time. Okay, the issue then is uh, how, how this transfers after we finance. That's actually the issue. Uh, Eric, Eric Thorpeck, Professor Thorpeck, uh, the one actually we initiated the, the poverty research that we do here in Africa through African Economic Research Consortium. Okay, he, he thinks that this route he will pursue, pursued can, and, um, uh, can quicken the time when poverty will be drastically reduced and he calls it um, a virtuous spiral of uh, development where you reduce poverty over time, you reduce inequality, Inequality also spa, uh, in, uh, steep, uh, 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 encourages in growth and all. But actually what we have shown is this strategy of uh, Professor Thorpeck is actually threatened by a pandemic because assets like ma ma human capital is then destroyed. So basically there's no mechanism for growth and for, for reducing inequality. So actually, okay, uh, I, I looked at the report last night, ran through uh, the slides that he, sent, he kindly sent. It's a very nice report from a, 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 an academic point of view, uh, but also policy point of view, in terms of policies that can actually be formulated and implemented. But in terms of practice, just to end with again a, a critique, a small critique, in terms of practice, we only mentioned Togo and South Africa in terms of specific things that governments can actually do uh, to reduce both inequality and poverty. I thought actually you were going to give more elaborate examples on practice because you are great expertise in that field. But this is a nice and uh, original report on global poverty, poverty and inequality. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Mwapa, for that uh, precise discussion on the presentation. Um, and so now I think uh, I think I will allow uh, maybe three questions before uh, Professor Luis can uh, come and comment on that. Um, uh, yes, we have just cut up your hand. Let me start from this side. So we have one two and three, then I'll, I'll pick the, the next from that. Okay, let us, I'll take those four. Then I'll come at the back. Yeah, so can we, do we have a mic? Just take the mic. Please uh, just say your name and then ask the question or make a comment. Thank you so much, Dr. Lopez-Cava, um, for your presentation. Um, this 
report is very welcome in, in the work that Austin does, and he does complement some of the work that we've done on our commit, commitment to reduce inequality, and also our report on taxing uh, extreme wealth. Um, my question is around one of the recommendations in the report um, on prioritizing um, long-term spending. Um, and one of the sectors that you identified is infrastructure. Uh, and looking at um, Kenya's context uh, and that situation um, where it has been catalyzed by uh, infrastructure-led um, um, borrowing, and we find ourselves in a, in a situation where we have um, austerity measures uh, which um, have an impact on, on, on vulnerable groups uh, and households. Um, my question is why, what, what, what is your, maybe you could be more specific in terms of um, the infrastructure and spending um, um, so that, you know, uh, you know it, it can be easier to understand um, why you know, some of the multilateral um, institutions are proposing, um, you know, in, in, uh, uh, cushioning vulnerable groups, yet, um, you know, the debt situation which essentially um, Global South countries are, are struggling from uh, is led from infrastructure, uh, land growth, um, and, and borrowing. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, yes, at the back. Ongoro. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. So the next is, yeah, okay. Yes, thank you. My name is
Thank you so much. Uh, last, uh, yes, Mark. Maybe Dr. Luis, you can respond to that, then we go to another round. Thank you very much for the comments and uh, for the, the both positive and, and the ones that are more critical. And also, um, um, I want to say that the, the depth of, of some of these comments would require really a whole conversation that could be longer than, than what we have now. So I will try to react with a few uh, ideas, but certainly not to, I don't feel that, um, you may not feel that I am fully addressing all the, all the elements, but the idea is to, to really continue the conversation. So one uh, point that re for me is very important is, let me start with, with, a, with an idea, old one. There is something called the Hume Principle that says that you cannot go from a positive statement to a recommendation without a normative statement in the middle. So there is no normative-free recommendation. Uh, so if we think that we can go from a fact to a recommendation in a way that is norma free of normative frameworks, uh, it's an illusion. So for me, that is very important because what we're presenting here are facts. One fact is that poverty reduction is slowed down, poverty increased during the COVID, inequality reduction is slowed down, uh, we saw the heterogeneity, and we saw the instruments and how the response of different indicators to, to, the, to the response of governments, and we try to understand what is the reasons for that heterogeneity. Um, I want to stress that uh, the instruments and, and the way in which you want to achieve the goals. I think we agree on the goal, which is poverty reduction. Uh, but I, it's very important to say that uh, the policy to achieve that goal is a sovereign conversation. So the World Bank is not here to tell you what a country should do. What the World Bank is here is to accompany that conversation, which is a sovereign process, with facts, with experiences, with technical assistance, with whatever the country demands from, from us. Uh, so I think it's very important that we have this conversation. Um, one aspect, for example, that for me is very relevant is uh, that both um, um, uh, the discussant and another colleague commented is on the use of poverty measures that go beyond the headcount. And I think that's a very important uh, comment. We do show in the report also the poverty gap, and the poverty gap squared, uh, which is sensitive to inequality. The idea is to go beyond that, and sometimes the conversation um, in, a, you know, in a public discussion, and I, I, I really, it's a reminder that we're in an academic setting. This, these type of questions, you don't get them 
in a, in a more, uh, you know, broader audience conversation. So that's what we show the headcount, which is the simplest way to talk about poverty. But certainly it really matters what is the depth of poverty and what is the severity. Uh, and I think if we look at that, all of those worsened during the crisis. So this is a very important point, and thank you for reminding us of that. Just to want to tell you that you can find those numbers um, in the report, and we can also make them av available if, if needed. Second, the importance of the poverty line, and that's why, that's why I, at the end I mentioned the idea of the growth incidence. And the uh, well, the, uh, at the end, every poverty number is imperfect because you can you can always go beyond not only the you know the poverty indicator itself, but you, you, we want to look at other indicators that tell you t tell us more about the pattern. Of, of, of growth and the pattern of the sh pattern of the shock, so that is why I think your point about the, the poverty line having you know where you set the poverty line really tells you a different story. I think this is very relevant, and that's why we wanted to be very, very to, to be very transparent and explicit, saying if you choose a different poverty line, which is not necessarily very high, uh, you actually find that half of the population in the world are will be poor. Uh, so we are very transparently saying that the poverty you choose matters. But I want to also emphasize that the mandate we, we get from, from countries that are shareholders of the World Bank and from the international community is that we should keep the focus on those who are the poorest. And that's why it really matters to have a line in addition to those that tell us a different story, it's very important to maintain a poverty line that really tells us who are the poorest among the poor. Because I think the world cannot turn around and look uh, you know, away from that issue. And the fact that tho those um, who are the poorest uh, you know, are, are doing worse after the crisis and we have a larger number is something the world should really be paying attention to. And that's why it is important that we do bring that extreme poverty line uh, to the conversation. Thank you for your comments on the assets approach. I think we share the view of the transformative, inclusive, and sustainable growth. If you look at the World Bank uh, statement mission, it's precisely that, to end extreme poverty, promote shared prosperity, which talks about inclusive growth in a way that is sustainable. Uh, so I think the question is, again, in every context, to have this sovereign conversation on how to achieve that, that goal. This is very important, and th th that links to the issue, for example, of privatizations versus no privatization and so on. I think um, th those are instruments, uh, not goals. Privatization is not a goal. Privatization is an instrument that may or may not work depending on the context. And I can tell you from the experience in the 90s in Latin America and the Caribbean and so on that also there is a very heterogeneous uh, I, I results in terms of, in terms of the, the experience of privatization, and one of the main issues, yes, is governance. So, as was mentioned at the beginning, I, I led a, the, the World Development Report on governance and the law, and we looked precisely at how governance, the micro foundations of how the asymmetries in power can really affect development outcomes, power of different groups. So, at the end, what you need is a coalition for inclusive growth that brings different actors in society agree on, obje on objectives and instruments. And this is what the World Bank can accompany. But it can only be done by local actors. And uh, we, we insist on that in the World Development Report 2017. And we, re we do look at how you know, power asymmetries affect outcomes. And I referred this also to our, my, our, our colleague from Oxfam, uh, the idea of how you, how you, you uh, collect the taxes really matters, which is what we emphasize in the report. Um, so um, it's not only about redistribution, but also how you collect the taxes in a way that is more progressive and so on. And on that, there is, I think, a, uh, also an international responsibility in terms of preventing uh, tax um, evasion and so on. So, so all these are elements that become, we, we go into the more, more, more complex conversation, right? Which is very relevant, and this is the type of conversations that a report like this wants to trigger in the local contexts. This is the type of conversations we want to provoke with these reports, 
uh, but again, it can only be a local conversation in, in which we provide, provide evidence, numbers, uh, 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 experience, and so on. And that's what we are here for. Uh, we do believe that poverty can be ended. I, after the introduction of, to this lecture, I don't want to be sound. To, I don't want to sound as contradicting the Bible, but, but we do believe that poverty can be ended. And uh, as let me also end with a quote by Isaac Rabin, who said, "Pessimists and optimists die the same way. The difference is in how they live." So let me give you a, a positive uh, message saying that it can be done. Thank you. And uh, there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. We have just uh, heard from the director of World Bank uh, who was giving a public lecture here at the University of Nairobi. Uh, Dr. Luis L Lopez has stressed on the need for better hand and high quality education, which is one of the ways through which we can reduce the poverty levels in not only the country Kenya, but also in the globe at large. One of the key areas of focus uh, when improving the education is getting rid of the barriers that uh, impaired uh, quality education, also empowering teachers in their efforts to deliver quality education as well as uh, investing more in infrastructure surrounding education. Aside from that, uh, Dr. Lopez has also stressed on the need for equity and uh, equality rather, so as to reduce uh, poverty levels. Inequality has also been termed as one of the as things always, which, uh, poverty levels has contributed to the increase in poverty I levels mean, in and across uh, the globe. Uh, uh, so I'm worried, has Africa become more inclusivity a frustrating repository? <laughs> Can you can you repeat your question? From my development economics of one studies, Africa has always had brilliant economic policy reforms, but there has been no end. There has been not been any significant economic change. Okay. So, as Africa become a, a frustrating laboratory of economic experiments, development experiments, with no any significant economic change. Okay, okay. Just pass the mic to. Yes, Professor. Yes. Yeah, just proceed. My name is Vincent Pogore. I teach at the School of Business and Management Studies at the University of Kenya. I must say I'm very happy about the presentation that has been made by Professor Luis and the response that we got from my teacher, Professor Pogore. Now, before I go to the scholarship I had 30 years at the Kenya University of Politics. So it is uh, from that experience that I would want to, to make a comment. Now, during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had the, the upper threshold of tax rate being reduced from 30% to 25%. And tax administration in Kenya is structured such that we have micro and small taxpayers, we have medium taxpayers, and we have large taxpayers. Now, during the peak of the COVID pandemic, we had a very interesting situation. We had very confusing numbers. But the micro and small taxpayers reported marginal increase in tax revenues. But the large taxpayers <coughs> reported marginal reduction in tax revenues. I, I want us to drill down uh, these numbers and make sense out of them. I, I actually
actually don't understand the term. Because we saw a situation where there was general reduction both in VAT as well as the income tax rates. But ordinarily that would mean that uh, we were actually uh, trying to take care of the poor who could not pay taxes. But this, the poor people ended up with a marginal increase. So I want Dr. Louis to kindly help us uh, interpret these numbers so that it makes sense to, to our sure. learners. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, there was a hand, where was it? Yeah, that one. There was someone there? Okay. Then before we come, yeah. Um, my question is actually more pertinently directed towards the IMF. But I understand that you are working with a sister organization. So it, is, it falls within your jurisdiction, perhaps. Um, my question is Your name, Michael. please. Yeah. Your name? My name is uh, Michael Morrow. Okay. So um, I, want, I want you to ask about the structural adjustment policies. Um, there are certain concerns from certain quarters that uh, they do more harm than good, especially since they target um, reducing expenditures, even in uh, maybe spending, public spending like uh, healthcare and education. Do you not think that these things maybe have a long-term negative effects on the productivity of a population when you compromise their spending on their health care and maybe their education? And then maybe um, certain concerns, maybe perhaps you can say that uh, it favors foreign investors to execute those structural adjustment policies um, and disadvantages maybe the um, local investors. Maybe because you get purchasing power goes down and things like those. So anyway, uh, to summarize, do you think that there are certain um, negative effects of the structural adjustment policies which are intended to tackle poverty? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, but um, if your question is not answered, well, you don't complain because... Uh, um, yeah, you understand, isn't it? Uh, can we pass it? There was someone there with a question. At the back. Okay, maybe it's too far. Okay. My question is actually very simple. It's more. Your name, please. Can you, can you speak to the mic? We can't hear you. Okay. I was just wondering why Professor Lully would be so you know, positive about the outlook while everything looks dim right now. And IMF has been helping us since the 80s, 90s, and the 2000s. What specifics have changed that makes it so have a good, you know, positive outlook towards the future? Okay. So... Do we have another mic here? Can we have the mic? Pass it to the... Okay. Thank you so much. You much. And I think since your neighbor has also carried up your hand, his hand, I think we can clear the two of you. Yeah, after you finish, you will pass the mic to. Yeah. Thank you very much, bro. Okay. Um, my name is Basra Ali, a former alumni of the Institute for Development Studies here at the University of Nairobi. And also currently the board member of the UNDP Africa Borderlands Center. So my question is. Um, uh, Actually, the presentations, the data that has been provided here, and the documentations that we have been given are extremely um, um, very informative. And actually, the presentation has just been amazing in terms of networking, in terms of linking up both the policy and uh, the grassroots work. 
My key question is, we've had, for example, uh, uh, for the case of Kenya, we've had the devolution, we've had a number of privatization, we've had um, governance issues that have really been tackled, and um, uh, the devolved government system and uh, the international and, and local non-governmental organizations have worked in the most um, um, disadvantaged groups in this country. But still, we don't. We still find that uh, the policy and the implementation bit has a lot of challenges in terms of um, uh, addressing the worst. Um, we cannot call them the worst, but the the, the, the highest uh, number of people who are facing high poverty levels. And uh, my question to the presenter, Dr. Louise, and the bank and its partners, in particular, is: What can we do? How can the bank and its partners really support the national governments to ensure that the policy and the implementation gap has really been reduced. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Because the data, the policy is there, but actually linking up that to the implementation of it. So, thank you, thank you. Uh, yes? Yes. <laughs> thank you so much for the presentation. presentation. My name is Dr. Kiti Lewa. I'm a lecturer at the Department of Diplomacy. I'm also the chair of the University of Nairobi Alumni Association Diplomacy Chapter. Now, I've got two questions. The first question is uh, on how the injection of tax revenue would uh, uh, increase the poverty level in the community. Uh, if we can get more clarification on that. And then the other question is on uh, what can be done to reduce the inequality in the economy in that uh, a PhD scholar from the University of Nairobi coming from Kilefe or Kwale would be deemed to be uh, not really of value as compared to a PhD holder from a place like Nairobi or Central Province. We have cases where scholars from the same institution have been denied employment uh, due to identity. Uh, issues. Can we get how these issues can be tackled? Thank you. So, thank you so much. Um, can I see if there is, if I will allow for another round of questions? The hands that I would pick. Because that is going to be the last round. So, if you have any planning issue, you just cut up your hands so that I'll take note of you. I can only see Two. Okay. Another. Good. So probably we can finish with these two. But only one question, Ongoro, only one question. <laughs> yes. So but let me start with your neighbor behind. The one seated behind you. Uh, one and brief. Um John my question is from um, fiscal measures the good nation. And my question is on the last year of pay, which has to do with the mobile last revenue of other 30 poor people. And on this report, on this pillar, it says that we should go in the task base on personal and corporate income tax. So my attention is about businesses. If such measures is being implemented, the people who are trying to control indirectly be paying these taxes. I'm so facing of it. So how are we going to protect the people who how are we going to protect them if they are indirectly be paying hands of percent of the taxes we are trying to uh, get out of them? Because if we increase taxes on corporate or personal income taxes, the businesses will also increase prices. So indirectly, how much percent of pay will pay by the people we are trying to protect? You, you have, I'm lost. Yes. 
Just put your question directly. Can you now shorten your question direct? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, Dr. Angoro. Yes. Uh, uh, the, you know, we are talking about inequality. Is inequality a concern? The most unequal <coughs> country in the world is the United States of America. Inequality has been growing throughout all these years. Yeah. So, why are we so much concerned about inequality? Yeah. And yet, the first economy in the world is the most unequal in the world. Number two, I don't know whether the question of human development index was addressed. Uh, I had allowed one question, so <laughs> I'll take the first one. Okay. So, so thank you. Um, Dr. Luis, I don't know whether you... Yeah. Thank you. Now, I just want to start by... In a way, I start with the conclusion, which is that um, very successful uh, in terms of um, our objective, which is precisely to not to provide all the answers, but rather to provoke the right questions. So in that sense, this is exactly the objective of this type of, of reports. I think these are the questions we should, be, we should be asking. So let me give you a few ideas. Hopefully, the report also provides um, elements for, for this conversation to continue. Um, I would like to start by this last one about why we care about inequality. I, I think it's a very relevant question. Um, it seems that normatively speaking, we should care about poverty, not necessarily uh, about inequality. I think there are many ways to, to, to respond to that. One is, let me give you two reasons, but we can broaden this. One is related to the idea of equality of opportunity, in the sense that circumstances beyond the control of people should not determine their their uh, position in society, right? And this comes from a very long tradition of thinking, and uh, the, um, the sociologists call this adscription versus achievement for a long time. Then John Rawls talk, talked about this in The Theory of Justice. Uh, the idea basically is that, you know, when a baby is born, has no achievement. He or she has no achievement. Yet, she or he has a position in the power structure of society. And that will determine, in part, the outcome, what he or she is able to achieve in life. That is something societies, normatively speaking, should care about. Because in which household you are born, which, are, which has nothing to do with your own decisions, should not determine your achievement in life. So this is one aspect in which we should care about that type of inequality. The other, uh, other types of inequality relate uh, which, which we also care about, is when inequality starts distorting policy. So inequality is so, so high that people who are very, um, I mean, beneficiaries of that concentration of wealth or income for a long time start having undue influence in the policy process and prevent reforms that would broaden the benefits of, of development to, uh, I mean, to would make them more, more available to everybody uh, from happening. So basically when inequality, and there is a lot of evidence of this in many cases, which inequality uh, results in uh, groups of society having undue influence on the policy, uh, on the policy decisions, and that affects um, uh, the outcomes for everybody. So there are at least these two reasons, I would argue, for which we can care about inequality. There are others that have to do with misallocation of resources. Inequality, for example, gender inequality has been clearly shown to be economically costly because some the talent, the human capital of women is not used uh, or exploited in a good sense, used, uh, put to a productive um, a, a activity in a way that society would benefit, right? So in that case, that kind of inequality also has a cost for society. So I can elaborate on this, but there are 
many reasons why, uh, even though we, we just show one indicator of inequality, there are reasons why we should care uh, about inequality. And that, I link that to the question on Economics 101, reforms and uh, not so successful outcomes. I think, um, maybe uh, some time ago, uh, Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister of the uh, UK, he said, in establishing the rule of law, the first five centuries are always the hardest. And I think development is a little bit the same. In the sense, development is a constant process of bargaining, uh, of policy making, agreements that imply policies and rules, and that leads to outcomes. So I wish, and we all economists wish, that the textbook of Economics 101 um, was enough to define how to achieve development. I think the question is precisely that we have to continuously rethink where, where are the, the, the areas of opportunity f to improve you know, the pro productivity, to make it more inclusive, and so on. So it's a constant process. There are certain basic things. And in the World Development Report 2017, we call it, we, we say, think of function, not only form. Sometimes we, be, we privilege the form of institutions, and we want to copy institutions from some other place in which they worked. But what matters is also the context, the power balance in society, many other aspects that can influence whether that form of institution actually performs its function. And not necessarily the case. There was also a comment about implementation capacity. We try to work a lot on trying to strengthen the capacity of governments to implement policies uh, that are, have been proven to be positive in other contexts, but that capacity is also an issue, and that requires a lot of effort and, of effort and time. So development is a complex process, um, but uh, there was also a point about uh, having a very positive outlook. I, I, don't, um, uh, I wouldn't say that I have a very positive outlook about what is going to happen in terms of the economy. I have to also say that after COVID and all these crises, uh, the future is not what it used to be. It's more difficult to predict what the predictions about the future would say. But I want to say, I wanted to be optimistic, not necessarily positive about the outlook. And I think the one thing that makes us be positive is history. If you look at with a, enough perspective, historical perspective, you can see that societies, specific countries, regions, and the world have achieved, achieved a lot in terms, I mean, you have this a very popular book by Angus Deaton and so on, you can see the trends. And the trends, historically, and if we look at the last uh, uh, three or four decades, the world has gone a long way, and countries and regions, and this country, by the way, in terms of, of uh, growth, in terms of poverty reduction, in terms of closing some gaps. So in that sense, uh, that, that gives us a perspective that you can be optimistic. That doesn't mean that the situation is very positive or, or, or that we should be unrealistic or realistically optimistic about this. I, I close by saying that the COVID crisis, I mean, we have seen in the political economy literature that the crises are opportunities as well. Why? Because they redistribute power. And they, a, a crisis redistribute uh, power, redistributes power in the sense, for example, of right now, politically, and somebody talked about structural reforms and reduction in spending in education and health. It would be very difficult today, in any political context, to defend credibly that we should reduce uh, resources for education or health. After what happened with COVID, and after what happened when we realized that the systemic risks can only be uh, you know, tackled with systemic uh, responses, it would be very difficult to argue in any political context and be credible we should be cutting uh, uh, education or health spending. So in that sense is that we can be optimistic. There is a consensus about certain development objectives right now as a result of the crisis. Hopefully this report also helps uh, in that process of putting on the table of the decision makers certain policies that maybe after the crisis were not so visible, but that right now we can uh, put on the table and perhaps create coalitions around 
these, these measures. So I would you know, say that this was a very rich conversation. I think the questions asked are, are the questions we would like to, to actually be a, a, a triggering in different contexts. The discussion is a local and sovereign discussion, but hopefully the bank can accompany that conversation with evidence, with experience, with financing, and with everything that we can do to support uh, that process that is only a local process. Thank you. OK, thank you again, Dr. Luis. Um, I, I hope I'm not locking anybody out on this. Uh, if you have a planning issue, no planning issue. <laughs> no, no. No, no, no. No, now if it's just one, I think we can uh, we can take it on the sites. Yeah, Doctor Angoro, I think one we can take it on the sites. Please, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so then, uh, let me take this. Uh, you know, when you ask uh, questions. And like uh, Dr. Ngoro has many questions like this, it means the subject is interesting, yeah. And so I think what uh, Dr. Luis has presented here is uh, we feel part of it, yeah. We are part of it, and we have many questions we can ask. And for sure, if I say now we, I open up again, many people will ask questions, and we'll be up to uh, tomorrow. So I think we could. Just end this session here uh, for today. Um, and, and you know what the World Bank has done? is just looking at one kind of a shock. That is the COVID-19 shock. But you see, we have many others. Like we can look at, we can talk about the climate change. So the COVID pandemic shock was happening. We had uh, climate shocks. And so they affect each one of us in each country in different ways. Right. So, so what he picked on is just one. Uh, the solutions he has put is one, but maybe if you look at another shock, you'll find that maybe one of the solutions he has suggested is not working. Now, in Kenya, we just a few years ago, there was a time when the government was saying, we are experiencing high growth. But the common person was saying, where is the growth? Yeah? Which means the issue of distribution is key. So you cannot uh, do without uh, issues of distribution. Uh, because we also saw it here in Kenya. The government is saying growth is very high, 10%. Then the common person was saying, where is it? We are not experiencing it. It means it was going to a few people, but not the, uh, the rest. So uh, all these issues are important in uh, uh, various ways. It just depends on how you look at it. So let me bring that session to a close and welcome back the uh, chair of the department uh, for the final um, uh, session, uh, uh, Martin. Equity Global Practice, Dr. Luis Lopez Calvo. In his speech, he has greatly stressed on the need for improvement in education, and not just education, but the quality of education, saying that uh, the better the education quality, then we will get to have reduced uh, poverty rates, not just in our country, but in, across the globe at large. We will be hearing from uh, the director in a few, just after he walks from the public lecture, which is happening here at the University of Nairobi Towers. But uh, more important than the education, he has stressed on the need to get rid of uh, barriers that impede, impede nations uh, from fostering and uh, providing quality education for their citizens. Other ways of ensuring that uh, the nations are educated, uh, we also have the need to ensure that teachers are supported in their efforts to ensure and provide high quality education. 
Dr. Lopez has also stressed on the need for equity, stating that inequality in nations when it comes to getting solutions and decision making and decision making actually uh, causes or rather contributes to the rise in uh, poverty levels across the country. As we speak right now, we have over 700 million people who actually live in extreme poverty. That number has been on the rise over the last five years, so much so that in 2019, the percentage rate in increase of poverty levels stood at 8.4%. But uh, come to the end of 2020, when the pandemic ravaged the globe, that percentage rose from 8.4 to 9.3, which meant that 70 million more people were actually uh, gotten into the extreme poverty bracket. Ladies and gentlemen, we would love to hear from the director just what more the World Bank is doing to ensure that countries, not just Kenya, but even countries in the sub-Saharan uh, region as well as in the globe at large, what the World Bank is actually doing to ensure that uh, those countries are cautioned from such setbacks as we witnessed with the COVID-19 pandemic, among other reasons that actually do contribute to the increase in poverty rates across the globe is a lack of peace, so to say. Nations that uh, tend to be ravaged by insecurity levels and the wars uh, tend to have more people who are in the poor bracket, extreme, actually, poor bracket, so much so that the Democratic Republic of Congo, as an example, has uh, seen increase in the number of people uh, in extreme poverty. For starters, uh, we got to see we got to see in, to see rather in 2019 that uh, there was a disaster. We got to see the Ebola epidemic ravage the country. Then we got to see the COVID-19 in 2020, and worse by far, we got to see the eruption of Mount Niragongo in 2021. All these factors contributed to displacement of so many people and uh, unrest in the country, so much so that uh, it contributed to the rise in the number of poor people in the country. But just one of the remedies through which uh, this uh, kind of ways can be remedied, we got to witness that in Cambodia back in the 90s, when uh, Cambodia was in a war with Vietnam, a United Nations intervention, peacemaking intervention, saw the number of pe poor people drop from 47.8% in the year 2007 down to 13.5% in the year 2014. And it is, some of, it is such reasons that uh, if countries, not just Kenya, but countries in the sub-Saharan region, as well as in the globe at large, if countries address this issue, the issue of education, the issues of uh, war, because countries need to have peace in their country, these are some of the things that when addressed, we will have reduced numbers of uh, people actually living in poverty. More to that, the director, World Bank uh, Poverty, Equity uh, and Global Practice, that is Dr. Lopez, has also stressed on the need for fiscal policy reforms. It is by so doing that countries will be able to foster a more favorable economic environment, so much so that uh, we will have increased number of people getting into business and actually growing the country's economy. This is one of the questions that we will be asking him in a few uh, once he leaves the public uh, uh, conference which he is giving here at uh, the University of Nairobi Towers. And while we do that, we would also like to hear from one or two of the participants who were part of this lecture just to get to learn and understand whether their expectations have been met when they came to take part in this lecture. Did they, uh, and actually now that they are done, did the director address what they were expecting. We will speak to one of two just in a few. I can see most of them are now anticipating the you know, exit of this uh, particular speech being delivered by Dr. Lopez. But uh, before we get there, ladies and gentlemen, we have had uh, links, uh, parallels drawn uh, between poverty levels and uh, climate change. So much so that the adverse effects of climate change have affected countries' uh, economic growth, whereby, oh, I can see we, uh, we're about to have people streaming out, so we'll also get to speak to one of the participants. But before we do that, climate change has also been attributed to one of the reasons uh, contributing to increase in poverty levels across 
uh, the country and globe at large. Because when adverse effects of climate change actually get rid or so to say adversely affect the agricultural sector, then we get to have reduced productivity you know, in a country which goes ahead to affect the economic development of uh, a country and then this actually causes the increased number of people getting into extreme poverty. But uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, we would like to speak to one of the participants who was here just to understand if at all the expectations were met. Uh, Karibu san, if you could kindly stand. Exactly. So you want to speak Swahili? I don't speak Swahili. No worries. We'll just uh, have it uh, uh, in English. If you could kindly look on this. We are, we are live at uh, University of Nairobi Channel. And my first question to you after introducing yourself is, do you believe that uh, your expectations were met when you came to this lecture? Uh, my name is Joseph B. Johnson. I'm a Liberian. Um, my name is Joseph B. Johnson. I'm a Liberian. I'm reading Development Studies, master's student. Um, the today discussion was quite interesting. So basically, um, it gave an outlook of where we've come in terms of eradicating poverty, reducing poverty, and the prospect for the future. And I think from the world Bank perspective in working with um, government across the world and Africa, because um, most of the discussion was centered on sub-Saharan Africa. That is where um, the, you know, the, the the, the, the desire to work out poverty, you know, it's still a major issue because a lot of other countries are doing well, but he said in Africa, it is still a challenge. And something he said was very good. He said, if we continue doing business as usual, we're not going to get out of poverty because it is expected by 2030, we should have reached that benchmark. But he said, the prospect looks gleam, but there can be hope if we stop doing business as usual, that means, you know, it brings in the, the conversation of governance. African countries need to do better in terms of governance, in terms of resource allocation, in terms of fighting corruption, institutional capacity, and so forth. That is how, you know, from the World Bank perspective, that is how this is going to become a reality. But the outlook is good from what Dr. Louis Philippi said. So, and we as Africans, all we can do is to keep working and supporting ways that we can to make sure that poverty and inequality become something of yesterday in Africa. Yeah, and just actually tracking back on what you just said last, the part of inequality, uh, countries in Africa have for decades uh, been accused of inequality, especially when it comes to you know, decision making where gender inequality is seen in governance. Do you believe this is one of the things that uh, hamper or hinder rather uh, our efforts towards attaining or rather reducing poverty levels in Africa? I mean, I, for me, when I look at inequality, I look at it across all spectrum, not just gender inequality. We have ethnic inequality, we have geographical inequality, we have historical inequality. So when you look across Africa, we see inequality in different folds. And each of those spectrum affects um, poverty or affects growth in development. So not just gender, but I think gender is one aspect, geographical is another aspect, historical inequality is another aspect. For example, someone in Kajado, they don't have access to what someone in Nairobi would have. That has nothing to do with gender. It has everything to do with geography or historical or even political inequality. You find out Kikuyus at one point might have more leverage than that of Luo because of who's the ruling elite. I'm just using that as an example, but across Africa we see all sorts of inequality that is undermining growth and development. Still on inequality, when it comes to uh, funding, especially from the World Bank, when you know they help the vulnerable countries all across the globe, yeah, don't you believe that uh, equality, so to say, or equity should also be extended in that, in the sense that uh, the countries that are more poor could receive more funding uh, so that they can succeed and probably get to the more advanced countries. Is that a thought that you share in or should uh, the amounts still be the same across the board, whether you're a first world country or a third world country? Um, for me, clearly I don't think, you know, the, you know, the, the in, you know, increasing support just financially is going to reduce inequality because inequality is more than just having, not having access to more resources. So what could happen is we need to focus on institutional capacity. We need to focus on, you know, 
developing our, our human capacity and a lot of other things, how we can, we can support some of the tenets of democracy that undermines inequality. So you, you can increase support from the World Bank to Africa, even 30 percent. But if some of those things are not addressed, that is undermining inequality, I still think we're still far away. So I think we need to get back to the drawing board and do what we need to do as a continent before I mean, asking for more. Because what difference it is if your house is not in order and we keep giving you more support? I mean, it would just widen the gap. That is, if, you, if you're a corrupt person and you are receiving 10 million and you're still corrupt and I increase it to 50 million, you think it's, it's going to change? No. Inequalities and disparities among citizens, amongst African countries are just going to get wider and wider. Absolutely. And to my last question is, uh, what is your greatest last take from this speech delivered here today? Um, what I think is we need to stop doing business as usual. That was something that was stressed over and over by Dr. Philippi. We need to stop and just go back to the drawing board and see what we need to do to help eradicate poverty for ourselves. Because you cannot get more help from outside than you can do for yourself. I totally appreciate that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, there we have it. Uh, one of the participants has actually taken uh, the need for better e uh, equality among not just the country but uh, countries all across and also the need for people to ensure that uh, they reach their utmost potential in terms of productivity so that even when the World Bank uh, funding or so support comes, then they are better placed to benefit from it. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, this I believe is an appropriate time as any now to bring to our interview set another guest uh, who will uh, share with us what his takeaway from this particular speech. Before then, we speak to the director of World Bank, that is Poverty and uh, Equity Global Practice, Dr. Luis uh, Lopez. But before we do that, uh, well, I can see here he is. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, here he is. Just a second before we can speak to the director. As it stands, we have over 700. Thank you so much, director. No, thank you. Uh, this is the University of Nairobi Channel. Uh, we would like to ask you a few questions. And uh, one of the key things that you have stressed uh, during your speech is the need for improved uh, quality of education. So my first question to you is this. Do you, do you believe that education, among all the other reasons, is, should be the greatest stress for African and sub-Saharan countries so as to reduce poverty in, you know, in the African? Thank you. Now, first to reiterate that uh, the main message of the report is that uh, the, the objective of ending poverty by 2030 is out of reach if we don't change the way uh, we approach policy. And certainly one of the largest impacts of uh, COVID was on education, uh, school attendance and school um, and learning. So yes, one of the suggestions is that one of the key investments in Sub-Saharan Africa in order to continue uh, or accelerate the path of poverty reduction is indeed on education and health. Very important, both education and health. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lopez. And my second question to you is this. We have seen the COVID-19 pandemic uh, provide one, one of the greatest setbacks uh, in the efforts towards uh, poverty reduction. So my question to you is this. How is the World Bank uh, in working to ensure that countries in the sub-Saharan region and Kenya as well uh, are cautioned from uh, falling beyond you know, where they have already fallen in terms of their efforts to eradicate poverty. What is the World Bank doing? Thank you. I think there are uh, three main ways in which uh, we are trying to address this. One is to continue protecting people who are vulnerable. There are still many people who are suffering the effects of COVID-19, but also the effects of uh, inflation. So the idea is to protect those who are vulnerable. Second, is to try to recover economic growth in a way that is inclusive and, and sustainable. Um, and the third is also to protect the fiscal sustainability of those policies so this doesn't become unmanageable for, for, uh, for the country. And just a follow-up on that, when you provide this support, which also extends, uh, is extended financially, does the World Bank actually follow up to ensure that uh, the support has actually been utilized in the manner in which it was intended? Yes, I think the World Bank is, is an instrument 
of the international community. So this is a demand that comes from the international community to, to continue investing and protecting Sub-Saharan Africa in this, in this process because Sub-Saharan Africa becomes really important for the global objective of reducing poverty by 2030. So I'm, I can only see an increased interest and resources devoted to that objective. Uh, thank you for that. My next question to you as we come to the close yeah, is this. Most of the countries in the Saharan region, which hosts 60% of the people living in extreme poverty, some of the nations are yet to actually feel you know, the work of the World Bank towards uh, fostering uh, shared prosperity. What is your message to them? Is it a question of time or is there that more needs to be done so that the local individual you know, in these countries can actually feel this impact? Well, I think that uh, the more inclusive uh, the growth becomes, um, the more we can achieve that quickly. So it is very important to make sure that the growth that is taking place benefits those who are at the bottom of the distribution. And that's why the World Bank is committed to that. And, and the poverty, concretely, the, the group I lead, the Poverty and Equity Global Practice, tries to precisely support countries in trying to make that growth process to benefit more those who are at the bottom of the income distribution. And uh, the, when it comes to now the particular support offered uh, across the board, because essentially there are some countries that are actually poorer than others, so much so like we know the sub-Saharan countries, the efforts that the World Bank affords these individuals, uh, do you uh, get to gauge you know, which countries to give more support because they have a longer you know, stretch to go towards attaining, you know, reducing poverty? Or, is it, uh, or what do you use to gauge this? So much so that you decide this is what we'll give to this, this is what we'll give to this other country. Well, this is something that is decided jointly with the governments. So, so it's not a decision only by the World Bank or the international community. Or the, as I said, the World Bank is the instrument of the international community. But this is all done in agreement with the government. So it's also uh, demand-driven. What that means is countries, uh, through very specific uh, processes and documents, are agreements about what is the specific needs and what is the type of support that countries need. And then the bank, as I said, is ready to, to provide that support. And uh, lastly, uh, Dr. Lopez, yeah? We, from what I got from the speech, uh, there, as we stand, the future tends to look a little bit bleak, which I'm guessing is not the feeling we want to you know, leave individuals with, whether in Kenya or you know, the globe at large. Is there an auspicious outcome in the future, and how far, you know, how far in the future are we talking about? Well, the commitment continues to be 2030, right? They could, to reduce poverty, eliminate poverty by 2030. So. I think the international community should not uh, abandon that objective. So if that's the case, what we need to do is to increase the amount of resources, both financial, human, uh, political resources, to support that, uh, the countries in the achievement of that objective. But I don't think the fact that it becomes more difficult because of the outlook should not make us abandon that objective. I think we rather should reinforce our commitment to that. Any last words maybe to the university community? No, just congratulations. I think it's a great uh, university. It's an honor to be here. And I can see how engaged the community is, in spite of the fact that we are in a recess. So it's very exciting to see this level of engagement. So I was very well impressed by, by the university and the quality of the conversation. We are more than grateful for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. That was the World Bank Director, Dr. Lopez Calva, uh, who has just finished his uh, much-anticipated public lecture that he was giving uh, here at the University of Nairobi Towers, fourth floor. And uh, he has stressed more on the need for education, which contributes to the reduction of poverty levels in our country. The director has also stressed on fiscal reforms in the country and the globe at large. And uh, just before we come to a halt, we'll also just to get a, a one or two views from one of the uh, individuals who took part in the discussion. And uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to invite my last guest on stage. Uh, kindly welcome. 
Uh, thank you so much for sparing the time. Uh, what, do you, uh, what, what would you say is the greatest uh, thing that you've gotten out of the director's uh, speech today? Well, uh, the exposition on the, the state of inequality and poverty in Africa is good. Actually, it uh, confirms a lot of what we have also established uh, through data in our own country. And so I think uh, there's quite a bit of work going on at the World Bank with respect to their studies on uh, poverty and inequality. Do you leave this conference feeling that indeed the 2030 aim will be achieved or is, the, or is your takeaway that uh, the time might be extended so much so that we don't attain the reduction of you know, poverty by the 2030 as stipulated by the World Bank? The policy trajectories in, in Africa particularly are you know, giving an indication that uh, there's every intention by government to achieve uh, the targets. However, the, the disruptions of COVID and, uh, you know, a number of other, you know, turbulences as drought and environmental uh, issues, climate change, may mitigate against, you know, uh, achievement of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the targets for 2030. You actually brought about a very key uh, thing, climate change, which I believe parallels can be drawn, you know, between climate change and the, you know, reduction of poverty. Uh, what more do you believe that nations, not just in the sub-Saharan region, but in the globe, you know, to, uh, should do towards uh, re addressing the adverse effects of climate change, which I believe they are doing, but do you believe more needs to be done because it's a contributor to the increasing number of people getting into extreme poverty? Yes, indeed. Uh, if you look at the question of uh, ecological footprints, where uh, the seeds, the agricultural inputs that the poor use are actually affecting or having adverse effects on, on, uh, on their farms and ultimately on the farm uh, outputs. So this actually depends poverty. So we need to address the question of quality seeds the question of, you know, uh, quality inputs that do not have, uh, you know, adverse effects on the environment, you know, and uh, continuing to invest on, on climate change mitigation. This, in my opinion, uh, would address issues of climate change and, uh, you know, cushion the, the, the very poor and vulnerable uh, from uh, the adverse effects of climate change. Any last words? I think we have uh, to be optimistic as Africans. We are the, the last frontier in uh, uh, development uh, of the world. Uh, we have to take it up. It is a responsibility that we cannot leave to anybody else. It is ours. Yes. Thank you so much you. for your time. And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. While the number of uh, people getting into extreme poverty has been on the rise over the last uh, almost five years, it, is not, uh, it should not be lost on us that uh, the future still remains. The 2030 target of uh, redu uh, attaining redu reduced number of people getting into extreme poverty by the World Bank and the U United Nations as well will, is still something that we can achieve. And as we have heard from the director, we should uh, remain optimistic the future might be bleak and might have been uh, sort of stifled by the disasters like COVID-19, but we need to remain strong and work towards at reducing the number of people getting into extreme poverty. That was the director giving the, public most the much anticipated speech here at the University of Nairobi Towers, and now we want to bring it to a halt. I have been your host, Edwin Austin, and this has been University of Nairobi Channel.